Um, so let me start by saying that I'm Marilyn Raymond, I'm one of the organizers of the conference, and I'd like to welcome you all to New York. Very, very exciting to see so many people coming with an interest in infant development and infant language and so on. So, but I will uh, say a few more words uh, after I have introduced Peter Sells, who is our head of department, and uh, he will say something to you before we start. Um, I'd just like to take this opportunity to welcome you all. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, I'd also like to thank our uh, invited speaker for coming uh, to participate today. Unfortunately, I can't stay around because um, I've got many other things to do. Um, so I'll just be here for the opening remarks and, th and then I'll, I'll, I'll duck out. Um, but it's great to have you all here. Uh, and um, uh, please make sure that um, uh, if there are things that you would like to have got out of today that you didn't, that you let Marilyn or Tamar know so that we can plan for the future. Right, so this is quite an exciting event for us. Um, we have sort of thought about having a workshop uh, to talk about our research to uh, members of the community for a long time, but we haven't gotten around to it. We, we've had uh, newsletters um, maybe once or twice a year for a number of years for families that uh, participate in our studies. Um, and we have been pushed really hard by the people who fund our research, uh, which, who in turn are being pushed by the government, uh, to communicate with people who might have a use for our research. Um, but we hadn't done it until now. So um, we haven't done it because we weren't sure how to do it, how to find you all, how to get the word out. Um, we wondered whether anybody would really be interested in the kind of research we do, which in some ways seems to us a little bit esoteric and is not, it's, uh, the work that we do here at York at least is not directly um, applied uh, in form. It, it, we can think of lots of ways that it might be of interest to people who do interventions, clinical work with children, uh, but that's not what we do. And so it hasn't been obvious that people really would be interested. And then, you know, other things come up. One finds too many other things to do and something that you're not sure how to organize, you just don't organize. So now, this time, um, we actually got around to organizing a workshop with the help of um, people from our colleagues from Sheffield who were very helpful in that way. And look, lots of you came, so we're very happy about that. It's very, very exciting. Um, so we owe a big debt of gratitude to um, uh, Sarah and Bill, especially for um, communicating to the people they know that we'd be doing this kind of a workshop today. Um, so just to tell you a word or two about the program, um, basically we have two sets of talks, um, and there's, there's three teams here. Uh, two from psychology at Sheffield, two from speech and language, or I guess it's communicative development, isn't it, at Sheffield, at Sheffield. and uh, two from linguistics uh, here at York. And although we all have communicated a lot with each other, uh, we don't, aren't in doing direct collaborative work across the teams at the moment. Um, so one from each team will be speaking in the morning session and one from each team will be speaking in the afternoon session. So we'll cover the three areas, both in the morning and in the afternoon, but the talks will be different. Um, we thought about having separate breakout sessions, which in the event we're not having because probably there's too many of us to do that, although we'll see, we'll, we'll think about it, we'll see whether we, uh, I think we'll come together as a group uh, in the auditorium after the break uh, this morning. Um, but it was hard to think of what the topics would be for the breakout sessions because really we have a community of interests that aren't very separate. So we're all interested in infant development in both communication and language. We're all interested in word learning and in social interaction, the role of the family and the infant's, um, uh, what the infant takes from its role in the family, if you like. Um, we're interested in memory, which is a critical part of learning. Uh, I think all of us have that interest, and we're all interested in, in general, the social context of language development and use. So it's hard to say, this group does this and this group does that. They're all part of a whole, really. Uh, and I think that will be particularly clear to those of you who work with infants. Obviously, all these things are relevant together, really. Um, so, as I said, I don't think we'll have the breakout groups. Our rooms are probably not big enough to accommodate three groups of an equal size, and we didn't want to have a different size groups. Um, so we'll come back to the auditorium after the break, um, which will be, I think, at 11.30, and um, Professor Bill Wells has agreed to chair the discussion. Of, he will be, I think, uh, organizing a discussion for each of the three talks in turn, 
Um, but the talks themselves will be, I think, 20, 25 minutes, and there will be time for a few questions immediately after the talks, and then we'll have more open discussion. But in the uh, discussion period, I would encourage you to um, think about your experience, think about things that you want to know and relate those to what we've been saying. You don't have to stick to questions about the talks. Go ahead and tell us what you know that you want us to know. Or, uh, yeah, so you can inform us and you can ask us and we're just hoping to learn as much from you as you'll be learning from us. That's what this is about. That's why it's a workshop. Um, then in the afternoon we'll have another uh, general discussion period and that one will, after we discuss each of the talks, we'll have a more open uh, question and answer session where the questions can go in both directions, I hope. So I think that's all. Um, I've given you a handout with the biographies of each of the speakers, and I'll just say a word or two about that uh, as each of them speaks. And um, without further ado, right on time, I think we are ready for tomorrow's talk. Thank you very much. Now I would like to introduce my colleague Tamar Karen Portnoy, Hello. Um, who is uh, here at York uh, in linguistics, and um, uh -huh. right. And so she is interested in the transition from babble to first words, and also in I think the role of input and the way children take in the input from uh, what they hear in the home. So uh, welcome. Good morning. Um, I'm going to talk about um, research we did, um, Marilyn, myself, and Ro uh, Robin Lindup Fisher, who started out as a research assistant and was so creative and helpful and excellent that he is an author on it, and he's now learning speech and language therapy in London. So <laughs> it's going to be one of you. Um, right, so the question we wanted to answer was um, to, to think about the role of isolated words in the input to children um, when they're infants, and the question was, are isolated words an important part of the input or not really? The alternative, to, uh, when I say isolated words, I mean words that have silence before and silence after. It doesn't have to be, you know, the only thing heard in five minutes, but it has to have some pause before, some pause after. So basically the child has an idea of where the word begins and where it ends and that the thing in the middle is a unit. And it's just, e question is, is it easier to hang on to units or to discover what are units when they come in like that? packaged as something separate than when they come as part of uh, just stretches of running speech, like I'm talking to you now, and it, it seems you know, intuitively that it would be much harder to find where the un units that are word-sized are if you just hear running speech all the time, and it's easier if you get them separate. So, so the question is, are these isolated words really important for very, very young kids um, to get the, such words in the input? Now, interestingly, there, is a lot of, um, there are a lot of arguments between researchers in our field about the imp the, whether these isolated words are important at all or not. Um, and as I said, many people actually think that they aren't important and that kids must start segmenting words from running speech. And when I say segmenting, I mean figuring out which, what the units are um, inside running speech and being able to sort of take them out, segment them out from the speech. Um, so many people think that this is the main task that infants actually have to do rather than to hone in or focus on the isolated words that they hear. And people have approached this problem of uh, are isolated words important or not in different ways. Um, so the f one thing people do is try to assess um, how frequent these isolated words are. And so to answer the question, do infants hear enough of them to learn from them? So this is, um, okay, I'll start out by reading things that have been written in the literature by people who are very eminent researchers. So people say things like, it's unlikely that attention to words in isolation is sufficient for infants to parse the input accurately. Parse meaning cut it up into bits, into the words. Most infant-directed utterances contain more than one word. Uh, and, some, and in another paper, we see, even when mothers were explicitly encouraged to teach new words to their infants, Words were presented in isolation only 28% of the time. In other papers, we've, the number that comes up as the percentage, uh, average percentage at which children hear isolated words is actually much lower, it's 9%. <coughs> so people look at this number and they say it's too little. Can't, it can't be meaningful, it can't be important. 
But of course, we don't know whether 9 or 28 is big or little because we have nothing to compare it to. It's not that we have kids growing up hearing 100% isolated words or kids growing up hearing zero and we can say these don't learn and these do. I mean, it's just a number, you know, whether it's big or little, nobody knows. That's just not a way of making any sensible claim. It's not an empirical claim. It's intuition based on something, but it's not, you know, can't, can't really consider this as evidence for anything. And here is my um, response. This is a discussion between two philosophers on some public toilet, I think. One of them said, life is short. The other one said, life is the longest thing you'll experience. And they were both right, right? So just saying 28 is little is not, that's not research. OK, so what other approaches have people taken? So now we're talking about serious empirical approaches. So people collecting data to try to answer this question. Uh, and one, one thing that people too, uh, have done is to present words to babies in the lab, either in isolation or as part of running speech, see which ones the babies respond to more successfully. So this is, this is empirical stuff, except that it doesn't look at what babies actually learn in real life outside of the lab. It looks at what happens when you present the two types of things to the baby in the lab in quite an artificial situation, which ones do the babies remember better or learn better or respond to better in that situation. The reason I think it's a little bit, well, it tells us about what babies can do in specific, uh, under specific conditions. But these conditions are so specific as to be sort of outside the regular, you know, flow of things that babies usually uh, experience. First of all, it's done in a room that the baby has never been to before, with people the baby have never, has never met before, with voices the baby has usually never heard before. So it's sort of like packaged as, this is a very special occasion. You really need to take it seriously. Mommy got dressed specially to go there. It's a very artificial situation for the baby. But it also tags the situation as special for the baby, I'm sure, because I think the babies can recognize that the mother is a little bit under pressure to perform and the baby is under pressure to perform. It's not just part of daily life. And so it's also marked as this is a learning situation. Please learn. How is it marked like that? First of all, by being in this special occasion. Secondly, you bring the child into a very quiet room, usually black, like very boring walls. And there's nothing there to look at or listen to apart from what you're given as stimuli. So it's a very, very artificial situation, and the things come at you in a rhythm that also isn't natural. So you hear something, you're expected to respond to it, and then there is a little bit of pause, and you don't know how long it's going to be, and then there comes another thing. It's very unlike a conversation in which you may hear isolation or not, and so respond to it. So basically, it's very restrained, very constrained, this situation. And so what we can learn from it is what the machine baby can do under sort of optimal conditions, but not what the machine baby does, okay, usually. Um, and under such conditions, the machine baby is a very good segmenter. You give it running speech with the same word repeated many, many times, and they manage to segment it out. Now, if, when people have tried to contrast isolated words with um, words embedded in sentences in these kinds of labs, uh, I, in lab situations like this, they get different uh, results. So some people have, managed, have found that there is an advantage for running speech. So when you have a baby looking at pictures and the baby hears, look at the doggy, or look, doggy, look at the doggy gets better responses. So the babies look quicker to the picture of the doggy and are more accurate. But again, you know, that's not how mummies talk because mummies say, or parents say, Look at the doggy. Can you see the doggy? Here's the doggy. Doggy. You know, it's not look at the doggy. Pause. Look at the ball. Pause. Look, you know, so it's a very, very different kind of situation from what children are, are used to. And the way you anticipate what's going to come next is very different from what happens to you in normal situation, normal day to day life. So these people found an advantage to running speech. Another study uh, found an advantage to uh, after you hear a word only once, either in running speech or in isolation, they found an advantage to the isolated words. Um, so people remembered them better. And another study found an advantage for a combination of both over either one in in separately. So there are mixed results. The third approach, which I think is the most 
the one that really seriously tackles the question we're interested in, looks at long-term learning. It looks at words that the baby has heard either in isolation or in running speech, in actual speech to babies, and looks at learning in the babies, which are the questions we want to answer. I mean, that's the question we want to answer. What do babies actually learn? So these um, researchers, Brent and Siskind, they recorded mothers speaking to infants. They looked at the frequency, meaning how, many, how often a word appears either in total, running speech or isolation or whatever, anywhere, versus how often it appears in isolation. Which one of those two predicts better the words that the babies will start using later on at 15 months? And the predictor, the good predictor was how often a word appeared in isolation and how often a word appeared in the input in general was not a good predictor. So they said clearly the babies are learning from what they heard in isolation, not from things that they just hear a lot of. Just hearing a lot of something isn't enough. So we wanted to take this kind of uh, an approach and uh, run an, uh, another study where we said we'll, what we'll do is we'll um, uh, give, the, give the infants, let the infants hear words with um, the same kind of uh, frequency, some of them in isolated, some, some of them as isolated words, some of them as part of running speech. Um, but they'll hear, this, they'll hear these words, I mean, we'll control for their frequency, but they'll be part of daily life. They'll be heard in the in the family, from the parents, over a period of time, and then we'll uh, invite the kids to the lab and see what they've learned. So we, like everybody else, test the kids in the lab in this artificial situation, but we are testing knowledge that was built from a daily, normal daily routine life with parents as part of your daily interaction with adults you know. So what we did was we recruited babies who were 11 months old, Oh, I forgot to say one important thing. This study isn't about word learning in the real sense where we want to know whether they learn a word and also understand what it means. We're only looking at their memory for the word form. So basically, does the sound of the word sound familiar to them? Do they remember it? It's not about meaning at all. So um, we started out when the babies were 11 months um, and we made a book for them, which I can, I'll show you in a minute. And the parents read the book to the children twice a day. We were Assuming that in most of these families, reading a book isn't a big deal. It's not something that they've never done before. So in that sense, it's part of a daily routine. And we asked the, the parents to read the book to the children over three weeks, twice a day, knowing that they can't. And we said, you know, try. If the baby loses interest, just stop. Put a bookmark where you stop and continue from that point uh, the next time. Just read for as long as the baby's interested. Just read when you have time. You know, you'll have to skip some days, no big deal. So you'll see that the... the the words were heard from the mother. It's not tagged as, in, as something special. Look, we're doing now something we've never done before, but really notice that it's important. I have to report it later to the university people. It's not like that. It should be part of something more natural. Um, and it's not, you know, we don't know how parents read. Do they read well? Do they read with expression? Do they not? Different people could read the book to the child. It didn't have to be the same person every time. So there are different voices, different styles, whatever. Um, we, we had the book contain uh, pictures of animals that all of them had rare names. Some of them are familiar to adults, but we expected none of them to be familiar to babies. Um, and we used rare names because we wanted to control for how often the babies hear them. We didn't want animals that appear in any child, uh, child book anyway. And after three weeks, the child was invited to the lab for a head turn task, which I'll show you in a minute. So that's where we measure what, what they've learned. Um, and it was very important to, for us that the learning conditions were as normal, as natural as possible. So at home, in a familiar place with familiar people and completely uncontrolled by us. Um, oh, yeah. this is the wrong, okay, sorry. That was part of something else that I thought I'd taken up. Right, so um, this, is, this is what the book looked like. So we had, uh, for instance, Dassey and Dugong. I hope none of you have read uh, books about Dugongs and Dassey's to your children. <laughs> and we tried as much as we could to have the preceding text be very, very similar, to uh, the text preceding the isolated words to be as similar as we could to the text preceding words that came in the sentences. And the words in the sentences were always the last words in the sentence. So actually, the end of the word was clearly marked by a pause, but the beginning wasn't. And so we have things like, look at this lovely pet, Dassey, versus look at this lovely Dungo, okay? Um, and the idea was that by putting the isolated words 
on a separate line and having them preceded by a full stop, we were hoping that the parents would put a pause there, but really we couldn't tell. We don't know because we weren't there when they were read. So, but basically what we didn't want to do is to have the isolated words surrounded by a lot of quiet and the other words surrounded by a lot of speech. So there is the same amount of speech on all the pages, only in some cases we expect a pause before the isolated words. That, that was all. And we didn't proceed the DASI, the isolated words within articles. We didn't say add DASI because we looked at speech of parents to infants from a different study that we had. And it seems that when parents use isolated words, they really use them without the article, just like that. Complete isolation. Um, so we made up that Robin worked for days and created three lists of animal names. And, and we, because we, you know, we couldn't be sure that every baby, no one has ever heard of dolphin and so on, the lists were rotated. So the list that was in isolation in book one was in sentences in book two and didn't appear at all in book three. Every, every book had, we had three versions of the book, every book had two lists of words in it, one, one in isolation, one in sentences, and the third list was not in the book. So for each book, there was one list that the babies would not have heard before they come to the lab, and two lists that they heard in two different styles. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. And we rotated it between the different children. So you can see here, Dasi, so in this book that I just took these pages from, Dasi was isolated and Dugong was in a sentence, and this list wouldn't have appeared. In another book, this would be in isolation, this would be in a sentence, and this list wouldn't appear, and so on. Okay. Now, in the head turn uh, task, which I'll show you now, every child heard all three lists. So you'd always hear, and you'd hear them as lists of words. So you'd hear them read. I'll, I'll play it to you in a minute. You'd hear the words you heard in your book in isolation, the words you heard in your book in a sentence, and words you've never heard before, but all in a new voice because it was someone working with us, not the parents. It was a different voice from which you he heard everything in the book. So here's what a head turn task looks like. Some of you may know because they would have brought their infants here, but some of them, some, for some of you it might be new. So uh, this is our lab. This is the door to our sound, uh, soundproof booth. So it's, inside it is, as I told you, very quiet, dark, and boring. Um, right, so the parents come. The mother sits on this chair with the infant on her lap, and she's facing a three-sided dark booth. This is what the babies have to look at for a few minutes. In front of them, there is a video camera uh, here that films the baby and sends the footage to another room to where the research assistant, who is Mar Mariam sitting in the first row here, is. And she measures uh, the looks of the baby. Now, the baby has, there are loudspeakers on both um, walls, both side walls here and on the other, uh, the other wall. And each uh, loudspeaker has a little uh, light next to it. So, we start out by flashing a light in the front where the video camera is to have the baby look to the front. And then we start out flashing one of the side lights. When the baby sees the light flashing, without even wanting to, the baby turns to the light. And when the baby turns, we start playing one of the lists. And when the baby loses it, when the baby is attempting, attentive, they look towards nothing, right? But they look towards the side where the sound is coming from. We do that, we look to sounds, I guess. And when we lose interest, and babies, when they lose interest, they look away. So what we're measuring is how long they look towards the sounds, which is a little bit strange, but it actually tells you how interested they are in the sounds that are coming from that place. And so we play each of the three types of list six times from random sides in random orders, and we measure each time how long the infant looked. This is how we measure. I told you Mariam sits in the other room. That's her desk. On this uh, screen, she can see the baby, which in this case, we have a <laughs> lion model. And the lion, or the baby, looks to the right, looks to the left, and Mariam presses the button to measure. As long as the baby's looking, she presses the button. When the baby looks away, she uh, puts her, takes her finger off the button. And so we measure how long the baby looks. And we average it afterwards. And what we want to see, what we ex expect to find is, if the baby looks more to one than to something, more to one than to another, we know that at, very, at the very least they distinguish between the two lists. Distinguishing in this kind of case would be based on familiarity with one thing and not, not lack of familiarity with something else. Okay, so that was what we were looking for. Is that clear how, how this works? Okay. So these are the results of this first study. Um, the babies looked most at the isolated words, which is this green column. 
and less, to, and to the same degree at the words that appear, the list of words that, came, that they heard before in the book in sentences or the words that they've never heard before. But babies were very, very variable and these differences were not significant statistically. So we couldn't actually make any claim based on this first study. It looked like we we're getting a trend in a direction that was interesting for us, but that was all. How bad, how, until when do I have to talk? 20 after. Okay. <coughs> so we decided, <coughs> never again, don't use three things to compare to each other. It's too messy. Um, it's always a problem because if one thing stands out relative to the two others, what does it tell you about the two others? Do, are the two others the same? Are they more? Anyway, we decided to run it again. Same method is exactly, same book, same everything, but we only test the kids on two things. So they got the same types of book. Every book had two lists, just as before, one list unseen before. But in the test itself, half of the kids now will be tested on only the words they heard in isolation versus words they have never heard before. And another group would be only tested on words they heard in sentences versus words they've never heard before. But each child would only have to listen to two types of things in the head turn itself. And then telling, getting a difference between two things is very much more interpretable than getting some sort of differences between three types of things that you don't really know how to interpret, okay? So here we have two groups of kids all listening to the same things in, at home but being tested on two different things. And now the results were much, much more easy to understand. So these are, um, so here we had um, 16 kids. Yeah. So did you repeat the experiment or did you just use the same data but compare No, 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 no. We ran it again on two new kids, uh, groups of kids. You can't, uh, it's very um, tempting to reanalyze the previous results. We could have, but it would have been sort of cheating, so we didn't. Um, sometimes we cheat, but we didn't here. We were really, really honest individuals. So we saw 16, uh, 32 new, new babies in two groups. This group, now I, I just want to remind you that they all heard words in the book, in isolation and in sentences. It's not that they got two different books, but they were tested on two different things. So the babies were tested on the isolated words versus words they've never heard before. Clearly listened longer to the isolated words than to the words they have never heard before showing us, at the very least, that they can recognize the words that they heard in isolation, because they show a difference, and this difference has, can only be based on some kind of familiarity with the words that they recognize. The other kids who heard the words that they heard before in sentences, and words they've never heard before, show no difference, right? So these kids are not giving us any, any kind of evidence that they can tell the difference between the two kinds of um, of uh, stimuli, which means that they are not showing us that they remember the words that they've heard in sentences in the book. Now it's interesting actually to see that these kids are very interested in the experiment. They look a long time, right? As, as long as these kids look to the isolated words. So it's not that they don't find the situation interesting and they might actually be finding it interesting because they have a sort of incipient feeling of familiarity, but it's not quite there, so it feels like do I know this? No, not really. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Something like that. But they can't really show it. They're not showing us clear memory for the word forms they heard in the book, whereas these kids are, okay? So to wrap it up, when we look at natural child-directed speech without and child-directed interaction, and we want to ask ourselves which words are more memorable to infants, words they've heard in isolation or words they've heard not in isolation, where we um, balance them both for say, identical or similar frequency, we see that the words uh, that the infants heard in isolation, word forms heard in isolation, are much more memorable uh, than words that they hear in, in, in running speech. Now, that doesn't mean that segmentation doesn't have to come in. It clearly needs to kick in at some point, but it's, it's another kind of evidence showing us that the very, very earliest words that ba babies learn to recognize probably would be words that they've heard in isolation. These are <coughs> easier, it's an easier way to break into language than to start straight from segmentation. Then they can help you segment the rest of the speech. The next, okay, so I just want to thank Mariam, who is a wonderful research assistant and who took over for, from Robin when he became a speaker. Uh, started studying speech and language therapy, and I wanted to thank the kids and you, you people here. And then I wanted to ask you, because that really bothers me, 
<laughs> can we do anything with this? So I've, I've given this talk to some high school kids and some, we, we gave a continued professional development workshop um, last week to A-level teachers. And I, I, so, you know, lay people say, oh yeah, maybe it can help us, you know, give advice to parents of kids who are late. Because clearly, I mean, the bottom line here is that it doesn't matter if we don't speak with a lot of isolated words. Those that we do have in our speech are helpful. That's all we need. And kids, typically developing kids, can use whatever they get. This amount that they get is sufficient for them to learn language successfully. We don't need to change anything about how, how families talk to typically developing children. So the question is, is it useful advice to give to people with children who are not developing uh, language successfully? Or is it, again, because it's done intuitively by parents, unnecessary to tell anyone? So that's what I'm a little bit unclear of whether, I mean, it's interesting, but if any of you have any intuitions about whether it could actually be helpful, I would be really pleased. So thank you very much. <laughs> Mario, you didn't play the stimuli. You might want to just... Oh, sorry. I'll just show... Yeah. I forgot to play the stimuli so I can play them to you to see what it sounded like. I think it's interesting. So this is what the babies heard when they came to the head turn task. Sorry. Bongo. Condor. Dunlin. Fennec. Gibbon. Pudin. Zebra. This is a list that for some kids would be the words they heard in isolation, for others it would be the words they heard in sentences, and for others it would be the words they've never heard before. So if the fact that we have the word zebra there, for instance, which might strike you as maybe it's familiar, maybe it's not, just adds noise to our data because kids would get it in all three mm -hmm. conditions. So, but that's what they heard there, just lists of words like that. So I don't know if anyone has any comments or questions, um, they would be really welcome. Yeah? Did you make a distinction between um, memories basically long-term and short-term? <coughs> Is this focus on just long-term Yes. Memory? So what we were testing was long-term memory. What the type 2 experiments I showed you uh, test, the ones where you have a kid <laughs> listen to something and test them immediately after two minutes, it doesn't quite count as short-term memory because short-term memory is supposed to decay very, very quickly, but it counts as something like an intermediate, something like working memory. We were, I was specifically interested in long-term memory because I want to know what kids actually learn, what, not what they can learn, which is what you do when you test them on these short-term or yeah. medium I was thinking along the line, lines as well of um, mnemonics and what you're talking about, so, uh, uh, words in isolation as being In the sentence, you mean? Yes. So, so I, I, I was presuming that in isolation, it, the words learned may not last as long as the words learned in sentence. Um, I think when you look at uh, naturalistic speech of parents to infants, they usually mix. So if they look at a picture, you'd get the, the, target, the word, the object's name, um, maybe in different sentences in different lengths and also maybe in isolation as well. So you get, if the situation of the joint attention, you know, two people looking at the same object and talking about it um, is the best kind of situation to try to connect meaning to sound form, usually kids would get the word form both in isolation and in, in a sentence in such a situation. Whether one is more helpful than another, I don't know. I mean, later on, after age one maybe, Sentences must come to play a role because otherwise you wouldn't be learning syntax. I mean, it's, you can't just learn English from listening to isolated words, but based on the, the very earliest words that you can catch, I think you can catch with meaning as, in, as isolated words as well. If part of the, you know, if when you are looking at something, it is named, it's memorable that way and you can then connect it to the meaning. One way of thinking about how words are learned is to say you need to know about the object or, you know, the thing. You have to have, like, some kind of a concept. 
and you have to have some kind of a word form and you need to be able to pair them together. If the word forms are more memorable when you, when you hear them in isolation, then that helps you with that part. The concept you can get either from um, interactions that involved speaking or maybe not. Maybe interactions that don't involve any talk would be en enough. And then you need to be able to put them together. So I think the meaning should be helped by isolated, isolated words as well. But it's, it's a question. I mean, it's not that we've looked at it, really. I have a question there. Yeah. I work with uh, deaf babies who have cochlear implants who are coming to um, this early stage of language development later on than your 11 month old. Yeah. Um, which raises an interesting situation in that to, to many of the parents it's no longer automatic what, what oh. you do with, a, with um, the, the developing baby. And we're giving advice about how you, you bring in those early words. And I wonder whether it might be worth repeating what you've done there with, with some of my people mm -hmm. is, um, to see whether they have the same effect. Because at the moment, what we're advising is that you put like put the words within sentences of various sorts. So okay. So it sounds to me like it would be interesting to, what it would be interesting to do with your kids is do this to see what the kids need, but also record the parents to see what the parents do. Yeah. And put them yeah. together. Yeah. See if the parents talk differently to them yeah. at the same level, or whether the children's language is at the same level. That's a really interesting point. Thank you. Where, where do you work? In Nottingham. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. Thank you. Yeah. And also to follow up from that, I'm just thinking about um, the mediation as well. If you're finding that children then are, those children who are struggling to meet, the, you know, to come into first words, mm -hmm. is that going to change the advice that we give? Are we going to say to families and parents of children who are really struggling to get to grips with language and move from being pre-verbal into words, actually single words in isolation is actually very valuable? Which is sort of different from a lot of the advice that therapists would give, mm -hmm. which is about embedding words within a context. And are you thinking of kids who have comprehension problems or kids who are produ have production problems or both? Both, probably. Uh -huh. It's a, I mean, I don't know, you know, I, interesting it's an interesting right? question, yes, thank you, yeah. I think the advice that we're giving to parents of late language developers yeah. is that combining both, you label the, the item, mm -hmm. be it a, a noun or an action actually, yeah. because that's the thing that's missing from these, Yeah. and then you try it in lots of different simple sentences, but you would emphasize the word. Mm -hmm. and okay. You, you try it in different contexts so that yeah. you get the role that it has within the sentence. Yeah. So you're, what you're doing is when they put them into sentences, you tell them to emphasize them so the word is segmentable e more easily because maybe it's longer or louder or something like that. So you give cues for segmentation. Yes, that sounds sensible to me. I, I when I uh, run that with high school kids, I let them listen to speech in a language that they don't know, and I ask them to try to segment words out of it, just to show them how difficult it is. And they, the words they manage to segment are words that are repeated often, or are very loud, or are very long, or in, in isolation. So it's the kind of thing you tell the parents to do, and it's, it helps. <laughs> yeah. I think in practice, it's actually a very difficult time to, to, do. to change the way they speak. What they do. So you. So what do they do that you don't advise them to do? So we give them advice, just like colleagues in the lab. They think they're doing it. Uh huh. And so. And the thing that they find difficult is the word in isolation part? Yeah, and I think just generally reducing, reducing, reducing oh, the uh -huh. language input. Our idea is reducing the yeah. language input. Yeah. To make utterances shorter, you mean? Yes. Yeah. Yeah.
Yeah. Yeah. I actually found, I was doing this yesterday with a child, with a, a lovely chatty mum, who was appalled at the idea of reducing her language because I think they feel more is better. Yeah. But here's a standard part of our um, advice to parents is to reduce, particularly at the um, pivot to word yeah. stage, to really focus on that and the child just getting to the word level. But, but, and when when they are videoed and watch themselves in the video, does it, are they able to change the way they speak afterwards? They are. I wouldn't say it's still that straightforward and easy. It usually takes a set of sessions yeah. together. And the, the powerful bit of it is not you telling them. The powerful mm -hmm. bit is you watching it with them and sort of picking out all the positives and focusing on the positives with them and then coming to the conclusion that, yeah, that worked, but I did too much of that or too much of that, yeah. and I need to reduce that still, don't I? So it's kind of less of us telling them and then seeing it yeah. in action. Yeah. So seeing themselves doing it is much more powerful than seeing you doing it. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you.